a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is the 15th reading of the wonderful book Martin Luther wrote and published in 1545 against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. What you don't know, of course, is that it has been quite a while since I recorded part 14, because today we have the 16th of December and I think it is about two weeks ago, but it's that is due to a lot of work that I had to do in this antichrist system because I really needed to earn some money at the end of the year as a wine salesman and therefore I had a lot of do visiting clients and deliveries and I just didn't get to the quiet state the, the, the sacred state you can always say that I needed to concentrate on this book reading um, I don't know how I'm going to call this one, because, uh, you know, uh, in German I have had 14 parts, this is the 15th, so in English this is even longer. I'll probably come, uh, come across something that we read, then I say that I can give this a title. But this is, anyway, the 15th reading of the book Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil by Martin Luther. And without any further ado, I will start, and I will pick it up on the bottom of page 344, the last paragraph. That's the last one full paragraph that we read last time. So I'm going to start right there and going to pick it up and tell you in Martin Luther's words, one of the reformers, not the only one, but one of the reformers, but like all other reformers, the reformer, the protestant, who protested Rome and who with every fiber of his body pronounced the papacy is the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. This is why we are reading this book, without any alteration of the way that Martin Luther spoke. We take his sarcasm, we take his wit, we take his brutal sometimes words that he spake. Unbridled, unchanged, we're going to speak the truth as it is, as Martin Luther wrote it almost 500 years ago. The second saying, which is supposed to prove that the Pope has come from God, is in the last chapter of John, meaning John Ultimo, or chapter 21, in verse 15, quote, Feed my lambs. Here in Pope Clement III's extra de elect significasti in, his, in this gloss, is this gloss, quote, Christ's sheep are entrusted to us, the papacy. In St. Peter, since our Lord says, feed my lambs, and makes no distinction between these sheep and those sheep, so that everyone should know that he does not belong to his sheepfold if he does not acknowledge Peter and the heirs to his see as his shepherd and master, unquote, etc. I was frightened, and thought I was dreaming. It was such a thunderclap, such a great horrid fart, that the papal ass let go here. He certainly pressed with great might to let out such a thunderous fart. It is a wonder that it did not tear his hole and belly apart. If I were to ask here, but what did all the other apostles, especially St. Saint Saint Paul, pasture? Perhaps the big fart of the papal ass will say that maybe they pastured rats, mice and lice, or, if it went well, sows, just so that the papal ass remains the shepherd and all apostles swineherds. 
yes, but what happened since Christ spoke not to St. Peter, but to all the disciples, as Mark chapter 16 verse 15 says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. So Christ's sheep are entrusted not just to St. Peter, indeed not just to the apostles, but also to the 72 disciples. Here you must hear the master and shepherd of all the sheep and understand the text properly. For it depends on a good interpreter whether one says, as you have heard above, that rock means the Pope, quote, to build on it means to obey him, to bind means to catch emperors, kings, and even the whole world. You must learn, and you must understand, in the decretals of the Most Holy Father, not Latin, Greek or Hebrew, but the new Roman language, just as above, the Virgin Paula III presented in excellent Roman the words Free Christian German. You remember the title of the very first video? A Free Christian and German, Count, German Council? The excellent Roman, the words Free Christian German to the Emperor and the Empire. Thus, the Roman meaning now is, Go you, that is you, Peter, you, go alone, into all the world, that is, to Rome, and preach, that is, set up a Pope to be God and Lord, to the whole creation, that is, who will have authority over bishops, emperors and kings, over heaven and earth. Omnes means everything in its totality. He who believes, that is, he who is obedient to the Pope, and is baptized, means kisses the Pope's feet, will be saved or will not be damned. He who does not believe, means is not obedient, will be damned, is a heretic in the language of the Pope. I'm going to repeat this. First I'm going to read to you the way it is meant, and then I'm going to read to you the way that is by understood and taught by the Pope. Meant it is like this. Go you into all the world and preach to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be damned. This is how the Lord meant these words. Now we read, what does the Pope understand from it? And how does he teach to the whole world that this was meant in his point of view? Go you, Peter, alone to Rome, set up a Pope to be God and Lord, who will have authority over bishops, emperors and kings, over heaven and earth, he who is obedient to the Pope kisses the Pope's feet and will not be damned. He who is not obedient is a heretic. This is the way the last part of third paragraph on page 345 when you go along in the copy of your own book should be read. There's quite a distinction between what Jesus Christ really meant, because what he put in the Bible is what he meant, and what man makes of it, right? With his quote-unquote own understanding. With the teaching of the Antichrist. When you listen to what the Antichrist understands of the Word of God, then you understand that he does not understand the Word of God. That's why the Roman Catholic Church does not teach the Word of God. The Roman Catholic Church is an enemy of the Bible. They forbid reading the Bible. They try everything that you don't read the Bible. They forge the Bibles. Since the 19th century they have been forgerizing all the Bibles. And of course, in God's grace, we still have access to the King James Version today. So get one as soon as you can. Otherwise, sooner or later you will maybe fall for one of the traps of 
the Pope. But Martin Luther continues, you have heard enough out of this passage, Matthew 16, to know that when Christ our Lord speaks of the world, uh, sorry, when Christ our Lord speaks of the word and faith, it is to be understood as the Pope's power, greed, idolatry and horror. Huh? Did you get that sentence right? You have heard now enough of this passage of Matthew 16 to know, to know that when Christ our Lord speaks the word and faith, it is to be understood as the Pope's power, greed, idolatry and horror. This is the rule and trick of interpreting scripture. Thus, the Roman see does not unjustly boast of being, quote, master of faith, unquote. We can read that in Magistram Fidei. Now, that is, he who knows it and does it far better than Christ himself and the Holy Spirit, who are his poor abacadarians. Uh, 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 Abyssidarians. Therefore, whenever Scripture speaks of faith or God's word, it is to be understood that the power of the Pope and our prison, as Romans 1 verse 17 says, the just shall live by his faith. That is, the Pope is Lord over all. I'm going to continue another interpretation of the Pope of the Bible. Huh? The just shall live by faith, that's what the Bible says, and the Pope interprets, that is, the Lord, the Pope is Lord over all. Or as John chapter 1 verse 14 says, quote, The word became flesh. The Pope reads, that is, the Pope is Lord over all, and dwelt among us, that is, we and the whole world are the Pope's prisoners in body, soul, goods and honor. For if this passage, Matthew chapter 16 verse 18, upon this rock I will build my church, accomplishes nothing but to make the Pope Lord and God over heaven and earth, then no letter in scripture can help but do the same. Yes, even Virgil, when he says, quote, You, Tatyrus, lie under your, uh, your spreading beeches covered, that is, you, Pope, reignest in Rome, woeing the woodland muse on slender reed, that is, you are lord over the whole of Christendom. You remember Virgil, I hope, from my reading of Rulers of Evil some time ago? Virgil's Aeneid is one of the absolute basis of the pagan Roman Empire. You have the uh, Sibylline uh, something writing and you have Virgil's Aeneid. And here Martin Luther quoted from Virgil's Aeneid. And he continues now, and Ovid, quote, This missive your Penelope sends to you, O Ulysses, slow of return that you are, meaning that is, the Pope is Lord and God over heaven and earth. Yet write nothing back to me, yourself come. That is, he who is not subject with body and soul, goods and honor, to the Pope is lost. Unquote. Does this seem to you to be ridiculous? Why don't you laugh much more over the crude as Clement the Third Significasti, which applies Christ saying, Feed my lambs to his power, which makes as much sense as all the verses, all the verses of Virgil and Ovid. Thus, this little song will serve us too. Quote, the cuckoo's fall into his death from of a hollow tree, who'll while away the summer hours for us as well as he. Now, I'm going to read it directly to you with the meaning of that, but this is the basis of an old German folk song, which is in German, Der Kuckuck ist zu tot gefallen. And um, you can read that in, uh, in the book Alte Hochschule und Niederdeutsche Volkslieder, that appeared in 1893. So this is an old German folk song. The cuckoo's fallen to his death from off a hollow tree, 
who'll while away the summer hours for us as well as he. Now, this means the cuckoo's fallen to his death means the Pope is master of all churches. From of a hollow tree, that is, in Rome, who'll while away the summer hours, that is, it is the Christian's duty, for us as well as he, that is, to kiss his feet. So we read in the folk song, the cuckoo's fallen to his death, from off a hollow tree, who will while away the summer hours for us as well as he. And it means, in Pope's speech, the Pope is master of all churches in Rome. It is the Christian's duty to kiss his feet. We have heard above that even if St. Peter alone had been ordered to pasture all the sheep of Christ, which is not so, and even is impossible, for we must not let the other apostles, especially St. Paul, be mice or lice herders just because of the Pope's farts and decretals. It still does not follow that the Pope also, like St. Peter, was ordered to pasture all the sheep. And the good bishops of the Roman Church, before the devil spewed out the Pope, never claimed or undertook it. They should all be heretics and eternally damned, because they did not believe the shameless papal asses article. Rather, the very opposite would follow, namely, since St. Peter ordained not only the Roman Church, but many others, in Bithynia, in Asia, in Pontus, and Cappadocia, as we can read in First Peter, chapter one, verse one, these names only, uh, these same uh, one, these same ones, sorry, these same ones, and each one in particular could boast of being the shepherd of all the sheep, just as well as the Roman Church, because they come from the same apostle, and can just as well claim Saint Peter the apostle founded us, not the Roman Church. Moreover. He wrote his letters to us, not to the Roman Church, as was said. Now, if these same churches are not the shepherds of all the sheep of Christ, whence does the papal ask at his claim, who does not have such strong testimony from St. Peter indeed, cannot prove any testimony at all? Peter, first of all, never was in Rome. Second of all, even if Peter had been in Rome, it is fact of biblical history that Peter was in churches in Bithynia, Asia, Pontus and Cappadocia. Why then does only quote-unquote Rome, meaning the Pope, claim that he is the church founded by Peter, when there is no scriptural evidence for Peter ever entering into the city of Rome. Well, this question is so easy that it is ridiculous even to answer it. It is because the lies of the devil are always so ridiculous. And they are all 180 degrees a turn around from scriptural truth. Now, what do I mean with that? Since there is no evidence that the Apostle Peter ever had been in Rome, of course, this is what Rome alleges it. That is what Rome states. This is what Rome teaches. That is what Rome is built upon. Peter was in Rome, they say. The Bible doesn't say it with any word. There is not one piece of evidence, even secular, written, proven, that the Apostle Peter ever had been to Rome. From the Bible even we can very easily see that he never was. But on the same, on the same note, the Roman Catholic Church says he was. And this is the lie they build on. So when the Bible doesn't say anything about it, they just say it was that way. They build everything they teach upon a lie. 
The Bible does not teach that Peter was in Rome, so Rome teaches that Peter was there. All the other churches, Bithynia, Asia, Pontus, Cappadocia, where Peter really was, could by that claim the same claim as Rome does. Well, because they are scripturally fulfilled that they were founded by Peter. Rome does not. But these churches never claim such thing. Because Matthew 16, as we have been through over and over again, does not claim that it was Peter alone, but Jesus Christ spoke to all the disciples, to all the later apostles. Yeah? Rome is built on a lie. That's something you really have to get. Rome is built on a lie. And whenever the truth says one thing, the lie says 180 degrees opposite. The Bible never ever in any place says that Peter was in Rome, so the Pope says he was in Rome. 180 degrees turned around. And the problem is that people should really follow what is written in the Bible, in the unfallible word of God, and not in the fallible word of man from coming from the synagogue of Satan, the Roman Catholic Church. Now Martin Luther continues, we have heard above that they are very unsure of St. Peter and that the Roman Church was first planted by neither St. Peter nor by St. Paul but by the least of the disciples, Aquia and others, who lived and had probably been born in Rome since they lived in all the lands as we can read in Acts chapter 2, among them verse 5. They all say that St. Paul was converted the same year that Christ suffered and rose again, in the same astronomical, not legal year. Now Luther here switches into Latin, and he says, Eodem anno astronomico non legali. Yeah? So that means, in the same astronomical, not legal year. There were many calendars in the Middle Ages. In Luther's time, the calendar year began March 25th. Now, this is a very interesting little footnote in this book on the bottom of page 347 that I want to go into for just a little moment. You all know the expression April Fools, right? We can read here that in Luther's time, the calendar began on March 25th give or take a few days, meaning that with the end of March and the beginning of April the new year began. This is how I believe it biblically absolutely is, because it does not make any sense for the, for the new year to start in the cold of winter, in January. And as we read here, about 500 years ago it didn't start then. So that means that the Julian calendar was different from the Gregorian calendar. Antichrist Pope Gregory not only took some 11 days out of the calendar in the year 1582 to change times, he also replaced the beginning of the year with the 1st of January. It is on the basis of the Gregorian calendar that we today quote-unquote celebrate the beginning of New Year on quote-unquote New Year's Eve, December 31st, and then of course January 1st as the first day of the New Year. That's only in the Gregorian calendar, and it's not on the godly calendar. With God we know that the New Year started with the time of Passover, right? So we really have to watch everything we can read here of the Pope. They all say, the book says, that St. Paul was converted the same year that Christ suffered and rose again, in the same astronomical, not legal year. Namely, that Christ suffered on March 25th, and Paul was converted on the following January 25th, as it is in the calendar, so the year was not yet up. <laughs> and do you know what another interesting knowledge comes to mind when you read a verse or a sentence like this in the book of Martin Luther? Yeah? I'm going to read it to you again, then we're going to see if you come up with the same idea that just hit me. Okay? 
They all say that St. Paul was converted in the same year that Christ suffered and rose again. In the same astronomical, not legal year, means astronomical, it was the same astronomical year, it was not the legal year. That's a quite important distinction between that. Because between March of the one and January of the other, you would today have not the same astronomical year anymore. In that time you did, because the new year started on the 25th of March. You get it? That's why it's meant here. But that's not the point that I want to make. The point that I want to make is saying that Christ suffered on March 25th, so this is the time of the Passover then, and Paul was converted the following January 25th, as it is in the calendar, so the year was not yet up, because a year is done when the 25th of March repeats itself from one year to the next, then a year is done. 25th of January, that's before. Now what just hit me when I read this is the following. Paul was converted on the following of March 25th in one year, January 25th, coming after that March, still in the same astronomical year. But when did Paul become converted? When did Paul... Uh, went on the road to Damascus when Jesus Christ appeared to him and said why are you persecuting me? When do we have the conversion from Saul to Paul? Isn't it always taught in the churches, especially again, the Seventh Day Adventist Church that after the stoning of Stephen the Gospel went to the Gentiles? But here we read that Paul was converted. And what did he convert to? There's only one conversion that can be here. And that means being converted to Jesus Christ. Because he was a Sanhedrin. He was a persecutor of Christians. Paul was converted the following January 25th. So the year was not even yet up. So this was still long time within the 70th week of Daniel. <gasps> you know the 70th week of Daniel, all the four Gospels, the Gospel, Gospel of Matthew, of Mark, of Luke and John, they are all proof of the 70th week's fulfilling of Daniel. Jesus Christ's ministry is the fulfilling of of the 70th week prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. Okay? There's no doubt about that. And we know that the first three and a half years of the ministry of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was it himself who had the ministry. And that ministry is recorded in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew, in the Gospel of Mark, Luke and John. In the end of all the Gospels, Jesus Christ dies on the cross for our sins and raises again, or rises again, three days later and then with Pentecost goes up to heaven. My point being, when we read in this book that the conversion of Saul to Paul was in the same year that Jesus Christ died, it is not after the stoning of Stephen that the Gospel went to the Gentiles. It is much later. Because this is even within the same year of Jesus' crucifixion. It's a very important point, I think, because this is another mistake, let's call it. Let's not be too harsh. That is being taught, first and for all, by Seventh-day Adventists. Now, when I went with um, some Fress and Brett Norman, uh, I don't know if Brett Norman was at that moment already there when we went through the four Gospels, uh, but when I went with, 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 with Tom and Brett through the Bible study, we really had trouble to understand that the stoning of Stephen appeared three and a half years later. 
because in the apostle uh, in the book of uh, of acts it is even recorded that paul takes here and there some time out and i understand it now in this way that's the three and a half years after jesus crucifixion where the Holy Ghost took over the ministry of Jesus Christ, who was first here physically, and after that in the second part only spiritually, through his spirit, that the going to the gospel is much longer after the conversion of Saul to Paul. And this little sentence in the book gives the idea that it really had been so. I have no doubt, I have no problem with what Martin Luther writes here. That Christ suffered on March 25th and Paul was converted on the following January 25th as it is in the calendar. So the year was not yet up. But Christ was cut off in the midst of the 70th week. And that's when his physical ministry ended. And then three and a half years later the gospel went to the Gentiles. But within the same year of Jesus' crucifixion, on January 25th coming, Paul was converted, we read here. So it is impossible that the stoning of Stephen took place three and a half years after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Impossible. So we continue in the book. Whether or not this is so, it cannot be very far off, perhaps barely a year. Still this would be much less than the three and a half years to finish the 70th week prophecy. It follows from this that the Roman Church had the Gospel and faith 27 years before St. Paul or St. Peter came to Rome. St. Peter didn't come to Rome, and my opinion will be verified that Aquia and others came to Rome, uh, and my opinion will be verified that Aquia and others who are mentioned in Romans 16 came to Jerusalem for the great feast, heard the apostles there, speaking in tongues, I add, and brought the word back to Rome with them. For St. Paul says in Romans 16, chapter 7, that his blood relatives Andronicus and Junius were famous apostles and Christians before he was. He then praised a woman, Mary, who had worked with particular zeal among the Roman Christians, as we can read in Romans 16, verse 6. Now, if Andronicus and Junius were Christians before St. Paul, they must have become believers in the year of Christ's suffering in Jerusalem, shortly after Pentecost. And they must have first preached here and there to Jews on their journey home, along the way, and thus become famous apostles. They could well have been among the 3,000 who were converted by St. Peter's first sermon, as we can read in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Now, there are 27 years from the year of Christ's Passion to the second year of Nero. This is about 55 or 56 AD. Luther's chronology here is not completely exact. When Paul came to Rome, in the second year of Nero. Acts 28, verse 14. That is why he praised the faith of the Romans in Romans 1, verse 8, which nevertheless he had not planted. He had not planted. Uh, so, was it Peter who planted it? No. Was it Paul who had planted it? No. Adronicus, Junius, and who have we else spoken about? A queer. Yeah? Very, very, very important part. When Paul came to Rome, that's why he praised the faith of the Romans. That's what the letter of Romans from Paul starts with. A praising of the faith of the Romans. But he, nevertheless, had not planted it. Thus, 
it can be assumed that the founders and the first bishops or preachers of the Roman Church were St. Paul's relatives, Junius and Andronicus. Whence can the Pope bring testimony like this about St. Peter? And it is credible that during those 27 years many Christians, young and old, were baptized and died and that the first Roman saints who went to heaven had never seen either St. Peter or St. Paul. But if a disciple or apostle institutes a church, then it is a true church and does not depend on the person, as we can read in Galatians 2, verse 6. God does not give a better or different baptism, gospel or faith through Peter or Paul than through Andronicus, Junius, Aquia, or whoever insignificant an apostle one may be. We also said above that the churches in Alexandria and Antioch were excellent churches, better than the one in Rome, gifted with special talents and people, and though they were not planted by apostles, especially the one at Antioch, which was, as Acts 11.19 says, planted by the scattered disciples during the trouble that arose over St. Stephen, but which nevertheless grew so much that the believers here were the first to be called Christians. Acts 11, verse 26. Now I'm going to open my King James Bible and we are going to Acts uh, what did I say? 11.26, right? Okay. So let's go there. 11.26. Trust C, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, verse 26. That's the next page. It says here, in the King James Bible, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So why weren't they first called Christians in Rome? The Christians came out of Antioch, not of Rome. Roman Christianity is Roman Christianity, is not true Christianity. There is a very important distinction between the true Christianity and Roman, quote-unquote, Christianity. Rome is built on lies, on a dunghill. And real Christianity is built on Jesus Christ, the rock. Not by Peter, but by the belief in Jesus Christ. So, to pick it up in the book. Let's see where the sentence here ended. Oh, if the Pope had the advantage that the disciples in Rome were the first to be Christians. <laughs> like I just commented. Oh, if the Pope had the advantage that the disciples in Rome were the first to be called Christians, then all the ten heavens, as the astronomers count them, would be too small to encompass the glory of the arrogant paunch in Rome. And it still is worth nothing, for in Christ all churches are equal. There is neither Greek or non-Greek, neither male nor female, neither Roman nor Antiochian, neither slave nor freeman. We are all one in Christ. Galatians 3 verse 28 but of course the Pope has to instigate sects and scream, I am of Peter, and he who is not of Peter is damned. Which is just what St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 3-4 through strictly forbade, calling carnal those who say, I am of Peter, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. Oh, why am I speaking so amicably and mildly about such matters? Antichrist Pope Clement III says that all of Christ's sheep in the world should be subject to and let themselves be pastured by him, the Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. May God punish you, I 
dare not say dishonor, for you are already much too dishonored, because you ceaselessly dishonor God, his apostles, church, and scripture. May God punish you, I say, you shameless, barefaced liar, devil's mouthpiece, who dares to spit out before God, before all the angels, before the dear Son, before all the world, that you alone are the shepherd of all Christ's sheep, regardless of the Gospels and the epistles of the apostles Peter and Paul, against whom you so knowingly spit and throw your devil's filth. There is not a single child who could not tell you about twelve apostles and Saint, and Saint Paul. My dear brother, what is it that is meant by I alone am the shepherd of all of Christ's sheep and master of all churches? But this Saint Paul and all the other apostles are not apostles. Or, if they are something... They must be heretics. They must be damned and false teachers, for they have an opposition to the article that St. Peter alone and the heir to his see the Pope should pasture all the sheep, dared to pasture more sheep than St. Peter when nothing was entrusted to them. I would very much like to say in a word in German here. May this and that befall you, Pope, for you can do nothing lie, deceive, blaspheme, dishonor the apostles, curse, devour churches, desolate bodily and spiritually, execrate kings, trample with your feet, bring idolatry, gobble up all the world's goods. And all this in the name of Saint Peter, this and that befall you, Pope. But I dare not speak such good German. The papal ass might get angry. Anyway, it's not fitting for a preacher who is called to bless to curse. But I express my great anguish with clumsy words. My Lord Christ, for whose sake I do and say everything, will pardon it. Yes, says Antichrist Clement III. Christ simply said, feed my lambs, making no distinction between these and those. Therefore... My lambs must mean all my lambs. Ah, oh, there's a sharp lawyer and sophist, but not among the sharpest, you holy virgin St. Clement. If only someone would stroke you, you ass, absidarian and bacchanal, with the whip until the flood until the blood flowed from your arse and teach you from the donut. That's a Latin grammar used in scolds. And to decline the pronoun meum. I must give crass examples to the crass ass. If Emperor Charles were to say to one of his captains, perhaps in Brabant or Flanders, quote, I entrust my people to you. Make sure that they are protected and that everyone receives justice and remember that they are my lands and my people, not your people, to do with as you like, as often happens. Unquote. Then, if the captain went off and boasted that Emperor Charles had simply entrusted all his people to him and tried to be captain wherever Emperor Charles was lord, in Spain, Italy, Germany, etc., and yet knew very well that Emperor Charles had many more officers, wouldn't he be a nice, ideal captain? In the same way, if every prince and lord were to say to one of his officers, quote, I entrust my people or my subjects to you. Make sure that you take good care of everything and remember that they are not your lands and people, but mine, unquote. Would that officer then try to be over all the people of, the same, of that same prince? Again, every minister. I'll use myself as an example. I am a preacher of the church in Wittenberg. Now I must take to heart Christ's command, Feed my lambs, for it applies to all the pastors and preachers in the whole world, in general and in particular. 
But because my Lord Christ did not say to me specifically, feed my lambs in Wittenberg, but just feed my lambs, suppose I set out to make Christ's sheep and all the world serve me, and make myself Lord over them, regardless of the fact that he has many other preachers in other places. What should one do to me? One would have to come running with bonds and chains and say that I had become stark, raving mad. In the same way, although the Pope knows, or at least should know, that Christ did not send Peter alone, but twelve apostles and St. Paul into the world as his stewards to pasture his sheep, he nevertheless sets out to apply the words of Christ to St. Peter alone, because Christ did not say specifically, Feed my lambs in Rome. Christ could not speak so specifically, otherwise it might have sounded as if there was uh, as if there were Christians only in Rome and nowhere else. And Saint Peter is not only the apostle of the church in Rome, but also in Cappadocia, Asia, Pontus, Bithynia, etc. And still the senseless fool and papal ass wants to have St. Peter all to himself, to be his only heir to the sea. Moreover, he wants to have all the sheep in the world, which St. Peter never had. And even if he had them, which is impossible, and to which the other apostles in Christ say no, the bishop of Rome could still not be St. Peter's only heir. Bring chains, robes, feathers and stocks. We have here a delirious, senseless fool, the very ass Pope. But God's grace is not entirely left out in such great wrath, and he did not let the devil speak with a completely free tongue. Instead, it was tied, so that he was forced to stumble, stammer and babble with a deceitful tongue through the Pope. In this way, his elect had a sign and warning by which they could see that the devil dwelt in the Pope, spoke through him, and, with his babbling, interpreted the scripture so abominably to lead the world astray. The devil must manage to leave his stench behind, by which one can tell he has been there. Oh, the dear Lord Christ had other intentions with the passage, Feed my lambs, than setting up a pope or devil against himself and his church, as even the Roman church's pious holy bishops before the pope arose in the name of all the devils believed and taught. He speaks with St. Peter and says, quote, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Unquote which Pope Clement wisely says nothing about, for it is poison to him. Then feed my lambs. Here it is clear that whoever should feed Christ's sheep must love Christ. Or, even if he could tend them and did not do it out of love, this passage which demands love of and the love of and pleasure in Christ would not apply to him. Now, all you devils of hell, help your Pope! This passage on which he insists so strongly and bases himself with stab, will stab out his heart. Psalms 37 verse 15. <laughs> Again, I'm gonna open my King James here. Psalm 37, verse 15. I have to look that up, what that says. So, Psalm 37, okay, almost there. Psalm 37, verse 11 it was, right? Verse 15, 37, verse 15 in the Psalms, it says, Dost thou know when God deposed, uh, disposed them and caused the light of his cloud to shine in regard to what we just read about the book here. Hmm? So strongly and bases himself his stab out of his heart. If he does not love Christ, he is not Pope. If he does not love Christ, he is not Pope. 
as they themselves must admit because they apply this saying to themselves. As long as he does not prove he loves Christ, he can neither tend nor be Pope, and the whole world is at liberty to care nothing for the Pope and to ignore him. With this saying he has trapped himself through his own mouth and his own verdict, sentenced, condemned, and dethroned himself, so that he is nothing at all. Just see once again how God traps the wise in their own craftiness, as we can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19, so that they in their wisdom must dirty themselves. As we heard above, the passage in Matthew 16, verse 18, on which the Pope bases himself, plunges him into the abyss. This passage, John Ultimo, verse 15, does the same thing, so that once again I would not know how to find the passage that would topple the Pope more powerfully. That is why it is said in the scripture, Do not touch me as we can read in John 20:17 leave scripture in peace if you do not want to find the true meaning and leave it untwisted or it will twist you into the abyss of hellfire and twist you in complete disgrace here on earth as now happens to the pope it is a consuming fire if you think you have caught it to your advantage, you are reduced to ashes before you can turn around. So what has the Pope won with these two passages? First, eternal hellfire. Second, eternal shame, here and hereafter, for he has been publicly exposed as a forger of scripture, a liar, a blasphemer, a discreator of all the apostles and of the whole Christendom, a lying villain, a tyrant over emperors, kings, and the whole earth, and a thief, knave, and robber of both the goods of the church and the gods uh, and the goods of the world. Indeed, who can tell it all? All these things he has originated and perpetrated through these two passages, as has been brought to light. Feet does not mean here that the Pope devil says to be Pope, to be supreme Lord, to have power, to force Christians into subjection, to trample on emperors, to ensnare kings and bishops with duties of fealty and subject them. Such works befit the Turk and the devil. Rather, it means the great service of preaching the gospel and the faith of seriously seeing to it that it is preached and thus building the church on the rock, as we can read in Matthew 16:18, of helping souls with baptism and the sacrament, admonishing and punishing the unruly, as Paul says, quote, admonish the idle, encourage the faith-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14 Again, praise and thank God always. Ephesians 5, 19 through 20 Again, pray constantly for all the world and lead a chaste life as good examples. 1 Peter uh, verse 5 That must be first. I don't know, there's a little footnote here. Just give me a second, I have to check this out. Yeah, so it says, Again, pray constantly for all the world and lead a chaste life as good examples. First Peter 5, and then the footnote says, A conflation of First Thessalonians 5.17, Luther and First Peter 5, verse 3. So, when you combine these three, you can read what I just read to you. Pray constantly for all the world and lead a chaste life as good examples. You know, this is a conflation of Luther 
First Thessalonians 5.17 and First Peter 5.3 So that many may be saved through his service of pasturing. Yes, this is the kind of shepherd the Lord wants. But nobody will do this unless he loves Christ. This is why the passage, Peter, do you love me? Then tend my sheep, or feed my sheep, is such an important one. Such shepherds are rare, and not as common as the two-legged bulls and papal asses in Rome. Before I start the second paragraph on page 353, I will take a break until the next reading, and we will continue with the 16th reading of the book Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil, written by Martin Luther and published in 1545, almost 500 years ago, next time. This was quite intensive reading and I think that your attention span as much as mine needs a little break now so I'm going to leave the video here I just want to finish with that um, my, uh, my wonderful brother in Christ Tom Fress already stopped last week with the reading of the book uh, and uh, you can find of course the playlist on First Amendment Radio of his readings of uh, Martin Luther's book in the description box of this video um, he did, uh, Tom did uh, 30 broadcasts on this book and um, it is probably very interesting when you on the one hand listen to my reading and on the other hand listen to Tom's reading so you will even get uh, <laughs> double the comments <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah not another vision but uh, you know um, Tom has his way of reading, I have my way of reading and I appreciate his way and uh, I hope you do too so go to the playlist of First Amendment Radio uh, on, uh, on, uh, on the book reading of Martin Luther against the papacy from Tom Fress and uh, check his reading out as much as you check mine out and I'll see you next time with the 16th reading of the book against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil until then, Jörg from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth, says God bless you. Signing off and bye bye. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape a false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape